Hey, hey, hey. How is everybody? Happy hump day. Hump day. Yeah. Thanks for coming in. So April is Autism Awareness Month. And what we are going to be doing is um, some more autism lives. I've kind of gotten away from that. I did some videos. But uh, it just really so that we can interact. Because I know a lot of you have family members or friends that are on the spectrum. And some of you are actually autistic yourselves. So I'm going to play my intro. We'll come back. And I have a very special guest that's going to join me tonight. <laughs> Hang on just a second. And we'll be right back. <music> Because your mind is on vacation and your mouth is working overtime. Ta-da! Hi, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. Oh, Shadabi, you can't stay, but you're stopping in. Thank you, sweetheart. Yes. Everybody hit the like. Subscribe if you have not. Little wing. Hi, baby. Oh, Hey, Stevie. I love you. <laughs> hey, Mac Talk and Snack. Hey, girl. Hi. Seth B? Yes. Hi, sweetheart. Rock a bit, Jay. You're working on your truck and we'll be listening. Oh, come work on my car. Mm. Okay, crime news with Teresa. Hi, baby. Oh, oh good. Shambles is here. Everybody can rest. Whoo. And Shambles is the a one and only baby. Hey, generally, Jenny. Hi. Um, but uh, I don't want to miss anybody. Uh, yep. Hi, yep. Oh, sweetheart. Um, good nanya. Hi. Evidently, you are the goodest nanya. Shambles is the one and only. Yes. The original, the OG Shambles. Um, but a twist. Hey, twist. How are you? 
Oh, yes. Oh, this is my son. I'm sorry in advance for whatever he must slip and say. <laughs> All righty. Yes, so I do have a special guest. It's another person that is autistic. He's young. And I'm going to bring him up. Hey, everybody, welcome to the stage. Claw. Hey, Claw. Sorry, my mic was up. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I've done that before. <clears throat> so how you doing? I'm doing all right. Good, good, good. Yeah, so April is Autism Awareness Month. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, when I first saw it was April 1st, and I got kind of ticked off because I thought, is that a joke? Really? We're going to do Autism Awareness on April Fool's Day? <laughs> but then I then I realized it's the whole month. So, hooray. So, you are a fellow autistic. I wouldn't put it like that, but yes. That is, <laughs> I, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's not like we get a special seating place in the restaurant or something. Right. Yeah, but um, so what I wanted to talk to you about was just awareness from one person who experiences it to another. And then we'll, we'll talk to some other people later on in the month about um, how they work with their family members with autism. But I was 40 years old when I was diagnosed 40. Well, actually it was 40 plus, but anyway, so I went through my entire life not knowing what the hell was wrong with me. You know, I was on the wrong planet. I didn't understand the humans. And then once I got my diagnosis, it was, it was like, aha, you know, it's, I understand. And then I started learning about autism and I was going through some behavioral training. Hi, it's ironic. Welcome in, sweetheart. Um, and so it, it helped me overcome some of the things that were holding me back. Now, a lot of people look at me and they say, you don't look autistic. You ever get that? Oh, I've gone that a few times. <laughs> okay. Between you and me, what does autistic look like? It's. Hmm. I'm, I <laughs> I'm, I'm hold on. I'm formulating. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I suppose it's sort of like a lurking thing. You don't notice it unless you kind of look for it. Yeah. Well, I always, God, if I had like a dollar for every time someone's told me that, because after I was diagnosed, I didn't tell anybody for a long time. Um, I was, I don't know, I guess I was embarrassed or something. It just, you know, to me, it was like a little boy thing. Little boys have autism not 40 year old women. <laughs> so um, I hit it and I was like in the closet. I was a closet autistic, <laughs> you know, a closet ass speak. And I was online and I, I joined some groups and stuff and, and we're all like, yeah, I do that. Yeah, I do that. Yeah, I do that. And it was sort of like, Wee, yay. <laughs> I, I found all my little alien friends. Um, but when I came out, people were, we're shocked. And I got that all the time. You don't look autistic. And so um, I actually asked one of my friends, one of my close, close friends, what does autistic look like? And she said, well, you know, like Rain Man. Have you ever seen that movie? I I have not. I'm sorry. Oh, no, that's fine. It's old. It's way before you. <laughs> but, um, Rain Man was like an exaggerated form of a high functioning artist. What, um, when I was growing up, people who were high functioning autism or Asperger's or whatever you would call it, level one, they called them idiot savants. Because, Yikes. yeah, right? <laughs> absolutely brilliant at something like engineering or, um, you know, mathematics or whatever their fascination was. 
but when it came down to like people interactions and things like making eye contact and, and knowing when to speak in a conversation, all that kind of stuff, they were idiots. And then if something went outside their comfort zone, they got overstimulated or whatever, then um, they would react. They would melt down. You know, they would stim, they would flap, they would, you know, um, curl up into a ball and try to get away from people, you know, as far away as they possibly can. So mm -hmm. uh, that's kind of like the, the era that I grew up in. Yeah, I could see how that would, I could see how that would shape your later reaction to it. Yeah, uh, because, you know, um, I grew up in the 60s and 70s, and I went through a, a history of autism study and, and the diagnostic and st statistical manual. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until the 1980s that they removed the term schizophrenic off of the autism diagnosis. The 1980s. Yeah, I, just, I, yeah. I actually, I actually did not know they attributed those together. Oh yeah. Oh. Yeah, those are those are way different. Oh yeah, they are. But you know, and I call it a medical practice because they don't know what they're doing. They're just practicing, you know. Well, that, that's why it's called that, yeah. Right. It's Hey, I'm glad you understand that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but my, si any, my sister's a nurse. Oh, is she? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I just tend to look up things I think about. Me too. I, my rabbit holes. That's why this is a burrow. Um, hang on just a second. Hey, uh, Hakob. Hakob, Hakob. <laughs> Hi, Rune. How are you? <laughs> um, if I missed anybody coming in, I'm sorry. But uh, yeah, so anyway, it was it was difficult. And I grew up basically learning what not to do. Mm -hmm. You know, okay, so um, I got to the point where I, I wouldn't speak. I wouldn't be the first in a conversation. You know, because if I joined a conversation, I had no idea when I'm supposed to jump in. So somebody had to had to make room for me. What do you think, Jerry? You know, that kind of thing. And so now I understand that and I can tell the people around me that, you know, I won't talk over you, but you do have to make room for me to say something. I. Uh yeah, I understand that. I have an entirely different way of going about that, actually. And that's, I took a self-improvement route instead of the, um, instead of the passive. I'm just kind of, I'm just looking at the people around me. I'm a lot more active in my problems rather than passive. Um, but that just might be a personality thing, honestly. I don't think everyone could do that. Probably not. I kind of think in pictures. So can you give me like a, a scenario? Can you use that in a sentence, please? Um, just give mm -hmm. us an idea, like a situation where you might do that. Well, generally, I'll think about a topic that's quite off the point, but related to something people are talking about. So I'll wait for a lull in the conversation, you know, like they, they get to a point, they're like, oh yeah, that made sense or something. Now I'll say, yeah, there's that. And then there's also like this part of it that I know about. And then I, I and, and then I continue on explaining that until they continue their part. Right. Okay. Yeah. That's good. So if you join a conversation, cause I'm, I'm usually okay if we all just, we're like sitting around and talking and whatnot. Um, mm -hmm. I kind of get a feel about what's going on. But like if I walked up to when I was at work, okay, there would be the water cooler conversations. And if I would walk up and join them, then I would, I would just wait, you know? Right. Um, I did that too. Uh, but for the people who can be active, I, I started, um, I actually started in uh, stores, believe it or not, like uh, malls and and 
and uh, convenience stores. Uh, occasionally, there would be people waiting next to me or behind me, and I'd be like, hey, this that like most people would know about, and I just talk about like weather or something, or something that just just happened, and that's either funny or interesting. Yeah, I do that too. In the store, I'll talk to people around me. Like, right. um, if there's a bunch of shoppers or whatever, and you almost crash into somebody, you know, I'll make a joke like, yeah, we need traffic control or something along that line. Yeah, uh, that's, but yeah, starting at stores is a very good uh, launching off point into getting to better at other conversations. Good. Okay. Now, we were kind of talking backstage for a while. Um, Nanya has a question. If it is a room full of people talking, how do you interact or assert yourself? That is complicated, honestly. I'll go with a general answer. I'll usually find someone I know the most and have most in common. I'll see what they're talking about and kind of integrate into the conversation after a few minutes. So I'll listen to what they're talking about remember why I know about the topic. If I don't know anything, I'll wait for them to top or switch and jump in. Oh, That's okay. yeah. It, it, nor, I, I said I'm more active, but there are some situations where it's just like not really feasible. Yeah. Um, have you ever had any meltdowns or um, like panic attacks? Oh, absolutely. I have, <laughs> um, I have very bad. They, they get very bad. Um, I, I used to call it hulking out hmm. um, <laughs> because that's, that. that's absolutely what happened. I have adrenaline control issues. That's not diagnosed. That's self-diagnosed, but that's exactly what happens. I don't need a diagnosis because I know what it feels like. When you have – so essentially it's the mixture of a panic attack and self-defense. Not a good combo. Uh, because you end up hitting anything that comes in front of you, and you're hopped up on adrenaline. Right. Yeah. So it, you get the fight part of. Fight, yeah, I don't. Fight, I don't. Fear. I don't have flight. I don't. I just physically don't have flight. I'll. F I'll choose flight if I'm like conscious, but if I get into the point where I have to, it's fight, and there's not really anything I could do about that. Yeah, I had um, – actually, the thing that led me into my actual diagnosis was um, – and people have heard this before, but I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell them too. But um, I was in this leadership development program at my job. Okay. And they put me in with these five people that I didn't know. And so we were supposed to go out and do a team-building lunch and, and plan out our – project and all that stuff and they were talking about sports and i'm not really an athletic supporter so i don't yeah. you know i i could probably figure out that the lakers play basketball and the cowboys are football but you know that's pretty much it yeah i don't i don't really like sports either yeah so um i like going to them oh my god take me to a baseball game i am thrilled and I will yell for whoever we're supposed to be rooting for, but I have no idea. But um, <laughs> so they were sitting there and talking and blah, 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 blah. And I couldn't join into the conversation. And and I my brain went dial tone. It's like I couldn't understand the words they were saying. Um, yeah, you tune it out. Yeah. And it's like, um, and I, I panicked and I told them, I said, I'm not feeling well. I have to leave, which was actually after one of my, one of my coworkers said, Sherry, you don't look good. Are you okay? <laughs> no, I gotta go. And so, um, yeah, then, then I ended up calling my counselor and then we went through all the, the diagnostic stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I totally understand why you did that. You weren't, I mean, you're, you were, um, at that time, did you know you were autistic? Was that before or after? No, that was before. Okay, that was that before. Was actually, yeah, that was that before my diagnosis. That entirely made sense. You didn't know the. You didn't know how to handle the situation, and you panicked. Yeah, yes. that's that made sense. Exactly. Um, 
I might panic. I mean, like if I were put in that situation now, like right now, mm-hmm. I would panic a little bit, like for like a split second. I'd be like, oh, I'm sorry. I don't really know anything about that. And then try to tr- try to transition it to what else they know. Yeah. Um, now that I have, I have my diagnosis and I um, understand myself more. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can transition. Oh, look. Steph sent you $20 because you're awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, and, if, if you guys don't know, I could see that as well. Yeah. It's on my screen. Yes. Um, so I'm going to play a little thank you thing. Give it to me like. <laughs> Bunny twerks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, sweetheart. I appreciate it. Um, let's see here. So yeah, it, it's it's much easier. Now you were diagnosed early. Mom said that you were diagnosed about six. A six or earlier, yeah. Okay. Alrighty. And um, so. You were in school by that time, right? You were like maybe kindergarten, first grade? Um, yeah, I started schooling when I was five. I okay. really didn't want to go, I remember. <laughs> yeah, um, I actually went through a bunch of my old like school records and report cards that they'd send home. And they were always saying, Sherry doesn't pay enough attention. She's always looking out the out the window or you know, that sort of thing. Right. Yeah. And so let's see. Can you take medicine at all to help? Well, in my case, I take medicine to help with my anxiety. Mm-hmm. But as far as um the I act- Yeah. Go sorry, go on. Oh no. Um, I was going to say, but as far as the actual like neuroprocessing, the way you think and whatnot, there's no medication for that. Oh, absolutely not. Um, I take, well, I'm trying to get the right medicine, but the type of medicine I need is for, um, it's basically ADHD meds. It's mm-hmm. to, it's mood stabilizers, powerful mood stabilizers. I have the way I stave off that, like the problem I mentioned before where I would do those adrenaline rushes, it's a the lot of patience. How did you, yeah. how did you develop the patients? I forced myself through the situations instead of walking away. It sucked. It was bad, but it made me better instead of making me, um, rely on everything you know yeah so do you do like a mindfulness practice do you do like breathing or do you focus on something or how do you do that it would be situational depending on what is irking me if it's like i used to have bad sensory sensory problems with my ears if there was too much noise i would start getting a headache um there's not really a fix to that one Besides walking away for a few minutes, letting it cool, and then coming back. But the rest, I would, like, I don't know, squeeze something that I know wouldn't break. Um, I would I would bite my lip. I would fidget more. Just get my mind off of it. The worst was when people talked to me. Um, I've had a lot of problems with the stool system. I'll start. We'll, we'll get to that later, I'm sure. <laughs> But um, a big problem was people. People. Um, kids are mean. Very mean. Especially around middle school. Uh, high school, mm. it's better. But middle school gets <laughs> deadly, essentially. At yeah. least in the mind of a middle schooler. <laughs> well, no, I mean, we go through that with YouTube drama. So I understand. Yeah. Oh, I've... I, that's the only drama that I keep up with anymore. It's insane. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I feel like my brain's rotting whenever I hear something new happen on YouTube now. Uh, <laughs> tell me about it. Preach. But yeah. um, but it was someone talking to me. 
like you know at me mm-hmm. like they had a they had a problem with me the only thing i could do was bear it bite my tongue metaphorically obviously mm-hmm. um and just not say anything because if i said something i would know i would be a lot meaner than the person talking to me <laughs> yeah um i too when i was in my 20s because i'm very organized and i see a lot of patterns in everything so mm-hmm. Um, actually one of my, my favorite quote is from a lady named Barbara Pletcher. And the quote is the real winners in life can look at every situation and say, I can make it work or I can make it better. And that was me. So, um, as far as, you know, the way things are processed or, you know, the way things are handled, that kind of thing, I can, I can step in and just make it miraculously wonderful. That's one of my autism superpowers. And um, so in my 20s, I did that with a cable company I was employed at. And they called me Dragon Lady. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that quote. That quote kind of encompasses my look on how to deal with high functioning autism. I, I don't have any words on low functioning um, because I I haven't experienced it. it is an entirely different ball game. Yeah. And that's a, like I volunteered at an autism center when I lived in Virginia and um, they were actually doing applied behavioral therapy with the kids, which I thought was torture because um, what did they do? Uh, well, Can you give okay. Me an example? Like um, you with the sound, right? Yeah. Okay, so if a child was easily startled or they had a problem with loud noises or loud music or something along that line, in the applied behavioral therapy, in this place, I'm not saying it's like this everywhere, but what they would do is they would immerse that child into an environment until they would stop reacting. That's actual torture. That is, that is definition of torture. Mm-hmm. That putting putting people in situations that they cannot remove themselves from and it hurts them. That is torture. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's and, the extreme of what I do to myself. I mean. Uh-huh. Like um like like I was saying, like to add on to this, like I was saying for myself, I would keep myself in situations, but I wouldn't force myself into them. Right. Right. That, that would actually torture myself. I'll, I'll keep in them for as long as I can handle, then I'll walk away or excuse myself, etc. Yeah. Well, um, when my grandson turned 21, um, everybody thought it'd be a great idea to go to this place called Dave and Buster's. Do you know what that is? Yeah. I've actually been there before. Okay, great. So, um, you you know, it's got like all the games and it's got the restaurant and it's got the music and all that stuff. Yeah. And so we thought, well, it's going to be fun. Let's go there. (laughs) And the thing is that my grandson and his friends and me, we're all neurodivergent. (laughs) It could be very, very (laughs) overwhelming if you're not prepared. So, um, we, you know, we thought we were prepared. Yeah, it's all good. So we went in there and it was packed and it was noisy oh. and it smelled weird. And we were in there for like five, ten minutes. And it's funny because the, the four of us looked at each other and said, let's go. <laughs> let's go. Yeah, just pick another day at that point. That's too much. Yeah, yeah, it was funny. I, I, I'm lucky to have been like, I'm lucky that the last, the only two times I've gone it's been quiet and on days where people wouldn't go. Oh yeah. Well, you know what? I shop at Walmart. Oh God. They, yeah, but they have (laughs) here. They have sensory. I forget what they call it. Sensory something. But anyway, what they do is they lower the lights. They don't do the overhead, you know, uh, clean up an aisle four. They don't do that. Um, And they turn off all the televisions And the music is very, very low. And so it's between 8 and 10 in the morning. And um, so I go during that time when I can uh, because that's just so much better for me. And there's less people. 
I don't know if, if like normal people think that they can't go, but um, during that time, but I love that. Yeah. So yeah, there are things that in society that, that they're doing to, to affirm neurodivergence. Right. I, I have mixed feelings on that. Honestly, it, okay. it's weird. It's weird to have mixed feelings when I'm like, you know, uh, one of them, you know, but I see it both as a good thing for people who aren't fully prepared for it and a bad thing for people who are already prepared for it. Um, and I, I think it leans towards, towards like, uh, almost an enablement, but again, I'm not everybody. I don't speak for all autism. Okay. I, I'm, I'm Asperger's or formally was called Asperger's. Right. They still yeah. hand out, they still hand out the papers for it on occasion. So it's still they, technically. They do. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you to Texan gifted one membership. Hey, sweetheart. Appreciate that. Um, yeah, well, I like the term Aspie. It comes from Aspie. I've never heard about that. I've really? never heard yeah. that one. A uh, long time ago when the earth was green and the internet was very, very small, um, there was a website called Wrong Planet. And I found it because I was diagnosed. And, and I, when I talked to my counselor, I said, oh, my God that makes me very happy because I felt like I lived on the wrong planet, you know, mm -hmm. and it was all different kinds of threads and forums about, you know, sensory issues. There were relationship questions and, and all that kind of stuff. That and sounds a lot like Reddit now, not that Reddit is the best place to go for anything, but that sounds a lot like Reddit. Yeah. Well, I, I kind of look at, at Reddit as being like um, Diagon Alley, from Harry Potter, <laughs> you know, you, you, you know get, where you're going. It's good. You don't, <laughs> right. You, you don't go down Nocturne Alley, you know, cause that's where all the dark stuff is. Um, but yeah, so that's, um, so do you have any like fascinations or special interests or. Uh, a couple that I stick to, I'll, I'll shift around on topics, but I'll, I'll stick to games and I'll stick to create creation. Like I, I could do art and stuff. I'm not that good at everything, but I'm, I dabble in it. If that made sense. Yeah. Well, you know, um, a lot of people thought that Picasso was some sort of weirdo, you know, we don't like his stuff and look what happened after he died. Right. So that, that happened to a lot of artists. That seems to be yeah. a trend. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, basically, you know, do a bunch of stuff and then fake your death so that you can get all the money. <laughs> Hi, Anne Marie. How are you, sweetheart? Yeah. So, uh, uh, You were going to talk to me about school, what school is like. Right. Uh, <laughs> uh, school was terrible. Um, it got better at the last few years, but it was terrible. Uh, I kept, I want to say I was switching around, but it wasn't on purpose, not on my end. Uh, so like we were talking about before the live, um, I... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> I was definitely taught to hold my ground, right? So um, I I don't live there anymore. I, I'm born in Ohio, uh, and I went to the Parma School District. Each, each and every time, I was forced to go to another school because a student would lay hands on me or egg me on so much to the point where I couldn't handle it anymore and I snapped. Um, I won't say it was never my fault. Not, I'm, not, I'm not saying it was okay for me to do any of that, but it wasn't okay for them to do anything that they did to me either. It, and were these primarily like your Hulk out reactions? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was 
I, I only ever snapped. I never did anything consciously until like middle school. And I was okay. like, end of middle school. Okay, so the the faculty or the staff there, were they taking into account your diagnosis? They should have been, because every single time they were alerted that I am autistic. There, there was no chance that they didn't know I was autistic. However, they never did anything to help me on that front. And eventually, I ran out of schools. So I had to go to a school specifically made for autism. And, and uh, how old were you then? I believe I was 14 or 15. Okay. By then. All right. That was, that was a better environment for you? Absolutely. There are, there were still problems with it because um two things can be true at once. Teachers can be underpaid and school systems can be underregulated, right? Mhm. Mm uh, those are both problems that need to be fixed. Especially since uh autism is especially now where there are more people and more people with uh, neurodivergency, or at least that are outwardly showing it, you know, uh, they're getting diagnosed with it. It's definitely a now time to start dealing with that. Yeah, they literally locked him in a janitor's closet. Oh, was that was that audacity? Yeah. I wasn't looking at my screen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sure, uh, Go ahead. In public schools, I would be forced to sit in the corner with a teacher one foot from me. Literally one foot from me, staring over my, staring at me, or like staring off while standing next to me. I couldn't get any space. I wasn't allowed to breathe in, and it would just take so much longer for me to calm down or do anything. I would end up missing multiple classes because I just couldn't calm down. Um, at the autism school, they did a little better. They There, there, there were two buildings I ended up going to. The first one, uh, they, they did have a room. They had a, they had a room that they would lock from the outside. That would let you get your frustrations out. I don't think it was built the right way. It had nothing in it, and it was padded on the walls. <laughs> uh, so it definitely didn't... It wouldn't have helped some people. It helped me because there was no one in the room. And this is in the 2000s? This was past 2010, yeah. And this is a school designed for neurodivergent children yeah they they didn't have the best budget they didn't have everything that they needed and they didn't have the staff to be able to take care of everybody uh it got better by the end of the year and of course right when i left they upgraded everything because that's how that works <laughs> always right yeah yeah uh, the, but when i left i went to the second building which um was better in a teacher respect because there were a lot less people uh, to deal with. Uh, like, like all the individual needs were a bit better, but they still had a bunch of problems. And I had some good relationships there with the teachers, and I knew... <laughs> I actually had such a good relationship. I was one of the few students who knew that the problems caused by the school weren't because of the teachers. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah, it was the administrative staff, which seems to be an issue with all schools. Uh, but that's a side tangent anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, so Anne-Marie asked, what is neurodiversity? So neurodiversity is a term used to describe the differences in how people's brains work. Yes. And tonight, 
Emery, we're talking about autism because this is Autism Awareness Month. And just real quick, um, hi, Burden of Proof. See you, Gaiman. I love you. Um, but yeah, so here we go. One of mine has selective mutism and taking him to stores and restaurants is what got him talking. But we had school issues too. Teachers trying to force him to talk or just plain nasty to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I had, I had similar issues. Yep. It, it's just a school system thing. And well, some teachers being <laughs> pretty bad, but yeah. Uh, so it's ironic says I worked in childcare here and we had training on children on the spectrum. It was inspiring. Hey, Samaj. Hi, baby. <laughs> My peeps month here to embrace superpowers. Yes. <laughs> so we had, um, we had a question that we were going to ask, like, what is the best thing about your autism? The analytical side. Um, it, it comes with like the problems of not understanding uh, emotions as well in, in, in an entirely different way, I should say, not as not under not not understanding, you know, right. Yeah. Just in a different way, you know, very slow. But the analytical side, I I got straight A's in math for years. It, it was easy to focus on. It was just an easy class for me. Good, yeah. I didn't yeah, I, I like that math, too. but... Yeah, and I think one of the, um, the stereotypes that people don't understand is that people with autism have emotions. Yeah, I have a I have a very flat face unless I'm like laughing or like I've I've riled myself up. I have to force myself to make expressions because I'm a very even faced. OK. And do you have face blindness where if you look at somebody like they do those tests? Right? Um, Is this person angry or sad or you're supposed to label them? Because no, I, have, I, I don't have that. OK, I have face blindness. So unless somebody is overtly uh, smiling or, you know, they look like their brow is furrowed and they look like they're growling or something, then, you know, to me, they're just a person. So I have face blindness. I might have, I might have had it a long time ago. A lot of my problems, I, I deal with a lot of my problems analytically. Like I've, like I said, that's the best part of this. Mm -hmm. I'm lucky to have Asperger's specifically. Uh, because it allows me to look at myself, see what's going on, and then change. It's not an easy change. It's not one sometimes I want to make. But I end up liking it later, if that made sense. Exactly. Exactly. I know perfectly what you're saying because... Mm -hmm. um, during my time, my undiagnosed time, when I was masking, um, I was doing that for other people. After I got my diagnosis, I started realizing that I can change myself so that I can understand people better. Yeah. Um, or change myself to act better, if that made sense. Yeah, exactly. You know, like... Like now, um, whereas before I would be totally uncomfortable because I would be trying to portray somebody that I'm not, you know, yeah, uh, or, you know, just be perfect etiquette, polite, that kind of thing. And um, now I I have more of a freedom to be my quirky self, <laughs> you know, um, yeah my weird sense of humor or what I add to conversations. Um, that kind of thing. Let's see, Samaj says, interesting. You can't see their emotion in the face. That has to be hard. I have to wonder if that's more of a condition, FRID, or if that's part of having autism. What is FRID, Samaj? Tell me about that. Yeah, I don't know what that is either. Let's look it up. I'm going to Google it. Okay. I do. Q 
Okay. Uh, Google says, is a Scandinavian Norse surname derived from the name of the god Fry? <laughs> uh, okay, no. Florida Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf. Don't think they mean that. Uh, free dic dictionary. Oh. What is this? Click. Come on. Open, 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 open. Open, open, open. Everybody's at home, so the internet is slow. Hmm. Okay, that might open eventually. Let's see. Afrid? Afrid. Let's look that up. What is Afrid? Audacity. Do you know what that is, Claw? Uh, no, I don't know what that is either. I've never heard of okay. it. Okay, it says Afrid is an avoidant restrictive food intake disorder. It's fairly new eating disorder. Children with Afrid are extremely selective eaters and sometimes have little interest in eating food. I don't think that's it. I don't think that's it. <laughs> yeah, let's see. Um, but while we're looking this up and while we're on the topic of food, I, along with sound, I used to have a big problem with taste or well, texture. Ooh, me too. Okay. So it's facial recognition identity disorder. Samaj, you are brilliant. That's why I love you. I'm going to look that up. Well, thank you. Yeah. I love, Hey, save Robbie. Hi, sweetheart. Happy anniversary. I hope you and Michael are feeling good. Save Robbie just had his one year anniversary. Happy one anniversary. Year yes. Okay. So it's called facial identity recognition, meaning that many either don't see emotion or they don't see faces. I have several folks who have that can't even recognize family members. Uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Um, squirrel. Yes, exactly. That's why I have a squirrel in my upper corner here because, <laughs> because one of my comorbidities is ADHD and I'll just I'll just zoom off over here and then they yep. have to bring me back. Uh okay, now that I know what that means, I only have problems with faces if I haven't seen someone and don't know them too much. So like um as I haven't seen someone in a long time, I mean. So I have, I have that. Yeah, um, so if, so if like I met someone one from like second grade, I wouldn't recognize them at all. But where I would definitely recognize my mother from like <laughs> from like three hundred feet away in a crowd, I could do right. that. Yeah, some somebody that you're so. My thing is, um, like, I used to live in an apartment complex, and I would have neighbors say hi, you know, and they would tell me you know, oh, hi, you know, I, I live in 213 and my name is Claire or whatever. And um, the, the next time I, I saw Claire, I didn't remember her name. And it's like I hadn't met her. But yeah. the, the more I saw Claire, the like if she changed her hair, forget about it. You know, because <laughs> there, were, there were certain things about Claire that I would have to commit to memory in order to remember her. Like uh, if, if Claire had moles on her neck or something. Yeah, then. yeah, I'd, that leads into the thing I wanted to say. S speaking on our trend of analytical side, um, that's exactly how I'd learn faces. If, it w if they seemed too normal, unless they had some very key identifiers, it would take a while for me to learn their face and name. Uh, but I'd slowly, as we're talking, I'd get their mannerisms, I'd get their, um, I'd get their, like, little details in my head, and it would stick, because now it seems important to my brain, instead of, like, junk information, right? Right. 
junk information for is usually like eyes. Like your eyes will filter out stuff that don't matter sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like really fast emotion is blurry because of that. They don't act, you don't actually see it. It fills it in. It's the exact opposite. It'll just ignore it if it doesn't matter. And you won't touch butter or eggs. Yeah, I'd, I'll I'll only eat eggs if they're done in a specific way, in a very specific way. As mm-hmm. for butter, I don't. Where are you getting butter from? I don't have a problem with butter. Not, it's not, I'm not. I'm not British. I won't eat straight butter, but I don't have a problem <laughs> with it. What are you talking about? Get out of here. Yeah. <laughs> what about their voices? Oh, yeah, that's... Yeah, that varies. Uh, I've I've definitely... I have more of a problem with movies than actual people. Like, in person, you hear a lot more of their voice than you do for a recording. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot easier to tell. But for a movie... I cannot recognize people by voice in a movie uh, ever. It, it's so bland. It, it's too much of the surface voice. There's not enough of the throat, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It does. So most of my career, actually all of my career, has been over the phone. I did very few like in-person interviews, which was you know fine with me. But I'd have to um, I'd have to record interviews about car accidents. What happened? Where were you? You know, all that stuff, and then get into the details. And so, probably as a compensation for me being a little a little low on the scale as far as emotions and and sometimes sarcasm and whatnot, I got really good at telling people's tone of voice and the word choice that they have. So if somebody was telling me something and their voice trails off or they get like a, 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 you know, kind of where they're, they're giving themselves some time to fill in information. Like when they start doing that and all the, yeah, I, I can understand that. Like they always do it in the middle of the sentence or at the end, but never at the start. Or one person will always go uh before they talk. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's kind of like the behavioral panel talks about baseline, because just like we did before the live, you know, I would talk to people before we did the interview, mm-hmm. and kind of set an expectation of what you know we're going to talk about, what happened, and if I have any questions, I'm going to ask you that kind of thing. So I would get like a baseline. It's so if they would uh like uh say mm, you know before their sentences or like like people some like you know I I did like that and they did like that and then he he was like you know I would get that down and then during the interview I could tell when somebody was not telling the truth because of the variances in their tone and the words that they chose. So then I would zero in on those specific details to get clarification on it. So I kind of, I kind of look at that as like, you know, they say that people who are blind get better hearing. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing that, that was, that was part of my autistic superpower. I'm not very good at te- at telling lies. I'm only good at spotting a little bit below baseline. So I'm better than most people are, but I'm not very good at it. I'm not like professional lie detector. Right. I don't think anybody is because at least with me and my autism, because just because of the way my, my brain is kind of black or white, you know? Yeah. Um, this is the way we're supposed to do it. And I used to tell all of my my new managers that you have to train me exactly the perfect way you want things done because I'm going to imprint on this. And if I'm trained poorly, it's going to be hard for me to shift yeah. out of that later. Yep. Oh, he sucks at lying. 
it again. Never get away with shit. Yeah, yeah I suck at lying. It, it's so hard to lie when you see everything in black and white. You you yeah. can't do gray. <clears throat> that takes that takes an awful lot. Yeah. Um because I have I have learned over the years, um, like for instance, I take everything literally, mm -hmm. you know, and I had a job, I was working at a cable company and I was in dispatch. And, um, so we were, we were out that day and we were doing what's called non pays. Basically we're going to turn off the cable cause she didn't pay for it. Okay. And so, um, I have a technician who comes in and he says, Oh, this lady is freaking out. And so I, I get her on the phone. She tells me, if you turn off this cable, I'm going to kill these kids. Guess who took it literally. <sighs> yeah. Guess who called nine one one. You did. <laughs> yeah, and guess who almost got fired you did yeah. yeah that's why i can't as much patience as i do have as much as i've built it up i cannot work desk no no chance in hell <laughs> yeah if i if i if i do a supermarket job and I have to sit there while we get ladies yelling at me for something I didn't do. Mm -hmm. I am not going to be able to play that off because those people don't stop. <laughs> Hi, Stonefly. Welcome in. Hello. Yeah, no, they don't. And, and the thing is that because you're analytical, because you can see the process, because you know what's going on when people are just, you know, raging around in their emotions all day long and just spewing all over everybody you know it's it's hard to it's hard to understand to it. them yeah it's hard to get them to understand that you know lady i don't work for nabisco and i'm not the one who packaged the oreos okay <laughs> um whatever the case is you know yeah so, yeah uh and our, that's another good thing with autism. You have a huge filter that most people don't have. You know, like, you know who to be mad at when you are mad and all that. Uh, exactly. Because, um, and I don't know about you, but I, I saw this example of, um, like, a neurotypical person, a normal person, right? Mm -hmm. They think of things like in a regular pyramid shape, in a triangle. You yeah. Know, they see the thing and they make a decision and it's usually based upon prior experiences and training and, and all that stuff. And then once they've made their decision, what they'll do is they'll go out and they'll, you know, um, dig deeper into facts or whatever to basically support their thought um autistic people are like an upside down triangle because we'll look at everything that's happening the situation we're going to analyze it down to where we make a decision do you find yourself doing that i would not describe it as upside down triangle okay. in fact i would place it sideways you're still starting at the tip of it but it spirals outwards instead of down to the point or, or down to the base, if that makes sense. Yes. Yes, it does. Because, you know, people say, oh, they think outside the box. And my way of thinking of things is I'm thinking outside the galaxy. <laughs> I've got 400,000 things that are going through my brain at the same time. So it will go from from old movie quotes all the way up to quantum physics for me to, to get down into understanding, okay, yeah, this is what we're doing. Right. Um, 
absolutely no segue here, but I've been wanting to talk about it as soon as you got onto literality. Yes, yes, go ahead. Um, sarcasm is a big thing for autistic people. It is a huge problem. Um, yes. I applaud my parents for helping me with that. They absolutely knew what to do. Uh, it sounds a little harsh at start, but coming from the person who experienced it, it's absolutely worth it. Um, and that's just to be sarcastic with your kid on purpose. If they get upset, you you make them understand what you meant, obviously. But you, you gotta... It's not something you can tiptoe around to teach. You gotta, you gotta do it. Exactly. Because... Being literal, if somebody was being sarcastic, like me, with with the lady and, and the cable kids, right? Um, mm -hmm. I didn't understand she was being sarcastic. Right. Sarcasm leads into hyperbole. Mm -hmm. And if you can understand both of those, you solve a lot of problems that uh, autism brings. Yes. Yes. Oh, you're brilliant. I love you. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for being here. Yes. Yeah, so uh, we were talking about textures. Wow. We got way off that, didn't we? Yeah. We did. <laughs> yeah. yeah textures. Um, I used to have a big problem with textures. Honestly, this is the one topic I'm going to have to say I have no idea how I fixed it. <laughs> okay. Uh, outright. I didn't have broccoli or anything for a while. I didn't have much greens. And, and just at some point, I was like, eh, and then started eating it. There, there was really no, nothing. I, I So I don't really have much to say on this point, unfortunately. <laughs> oh, that's good. I have, um, I have a thing about, like, grapes, whole grapes, and, like, cherry tomatoes. I have to either I have to either like nibble on them so that the skin is broken so they don't pop. Oh, I actually like grapes. See, it's the opposite for me. I was, I, I didn't I couldn't handle stuff like uh, spinach because it's smooth and then there's that vein mm -hmm. in the middle and that would always <laughs> mess with my tongue. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't like that. Yeah, I don't. I I used to not like things that were crunchy but wet. That was a big texture problem for me. So I that's why I didn't eat broccoli because most right. of the ways you prepare it, it ends up being wet. Right. Um, I just I yeah, and I just kind of got over that, and I don't know how. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, like I said, I I love I love grapes and I love cherry tomatoes, but I still have a thing where if I just put it in my mouth whole and I bite into it and it pops. But then again, I have, I have a really heightened startle reaction. Yeah. So loud noises or somebody sneaking up on me or whatever, I'm going to startle. Um, and it's something that maybe I, I need to work on. I don't know. Uh, so my styrofoam. Says, styrofoam. Yes. Grossed out by the feel and the sound. Uh, yeah, no insight from me on this one either. I never had a problem with styrofoam. Oh, it's the squeaky texture and the feel and the smell. It's so weird. We could go the on and smell. On oh, yeah, the smells off. I always feel off smelling styrofoam. Everything, yeah. else, everything else about it, I don't really have a problem with personally. Yeah. I actually, um, I was doing like a, I was, I was building this halloween thing and i was using styrofoam and i was cutting it oh and yeah the, it made it whole, smell oh the whole time i was oh god if i could have found anything other than styrofoam, <laughs> i would have used it yep um it if you can find it all right here's a little like tip for when you have problems like that i don't know if you already know it, but for anyone listening who has a problem with that, find a smell that can't overwhelm you. Find a smell that you like, and no matter how much you have of it, it won't overwhelm your nose. Mm -hmm. Put put like a dab of that under your nostrils. You will not smell anything else but that. <laughs> oh, I like that. 
Woo-hoo. And that completely circumvents the problem of smelling anything. Um, if it's not enough, just place a little more. Again, find a find a smell that you do not hate. <laughs> yeah. So how does your neurodivergent brain process specific things? Some differences for understanding of how it works is what I'm asking. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's tricky to answer because I don't know how other people think in the first place. I guess I could just explain how I think of stuff. Um, it's a very rigid process. I take in information. What is it? What's causing it? Can I solve it if it needs to be solved? If it doesn't need to be solved, do I need to be near it? Et cetera, et cetera, all the way down to the end. That's That's it. There's no like loops around or anything there's just straight straight to the point yeah um <clears throat> and it's hard to say how um how somebody who's autistic or neurodivergent processes things because like you said we don't know how y'all process things and, right and it even and goes for other neurodivergence mm -hmm. it's just yeah, it's like, is red red to other people? That's impossible to tell. <laughs> exactly. Red is red, but what is red? Nobody knows, because everyone knows. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like, okay, like, I've explained to people that I think in pictures. Okay, yeah. so so when I'm talking to you and I'm going to explain something to you, I'm going to give you a word picture, like, You've noticed, like, you know, the the water cooler, you know, talk or the... Right, you the, equate you, know, you equate things a lot to explain. Uh, I do. I do. And that's that's just the way I grew up. So when, when you're talking to me, I'm seeing it. Yeah. Um, and then if it came down to some... And I think that's why... That's why I have like really amazing pattern recognition because right. I'm seeing it. Yeah, I don't have that. I have a subtype of that that's on the other edge. I can see things in my mind like in 3D. So if I was working on a car, right? Let's use that as an example because mm -hmm. people were talking about that at the start. <laughs> um, I know what an engine looks like, like taken out of the car. So in the car, if I need to maneuver my hand around, I know where to put my hand, even if I don't see it. Because I could see what the engine looks like. I know what it looks like, so I know how to move. That's amazing. You know, when I was a kid, I used to tear things apart. I would, like, reverse engineer everything. And uh, one time ended up in the emergency room because I broke open an Etch-a-Sketch. Oh. And my mom freaked out because I had Etch-a-Sketch goo all over me. So, no, but I, I know exactly what you're talking about. Because if if you can see, if you can visualize it and, and you have a spatial identity to it, then it's easier to to manage oh yeah cool 3d model in your mind yeah moose moose moose, moose? <laughs> i oh yeah maybe not squirrel it's a moose <laughs> no, no. I don't, I don't. Oh, okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah so um what are the things that you wish people knew about autism or things maybe that if people were aware that they they wouldn't do like what are some of the don'ts if you were to tell people right uh first big one do not touch anyone without alerting them of your presence first even if you have to like say before like even just enunciate something before you touch them so that you know you're there it's like a lot 
it's a lot better to scare them because they don't know you're there by voice than to touch them and potentially have way bigger problems. Have somebody hulk out on you. Uh, yeah, hulk out or just shut down because they were touched. Some people yeah. do that. Yeah. I have, um, I have a thing where, oops, I lost him. There you are. Are you back with me? Uh, yeah, did something happen? Yeah, you dropped off for a second. Oh. But, um, I have a thing where if someone just comes up to me and hugs me, like if I'm not even like, the, oh my God, hi, you know, that kind of thing. Oh yeah. Uh, I, that, I can't handle random hugs. Yeah. That freaks me out. <laughs> I have to mentally prepare myself. Okay. We're in a huggy situation. You know, we're going to be doing hugs yeah. and then, then I'm cool. So I totally relate to that. What else? What else that don't touch? Uh, don't don't assume that they're always listening. It's not that they, it's not that they don't want to listen to you. It's that they sometimes might not be able to, <laughs> uh, because they're just tuning it out automatically and not by their own will. And do you find that's because when you talk, I do this, okay? Because I have my fascinations, I have my special interests, my, my rabbit holes that I go down into, that if we get on my topic or I, I'm i talking about it, I'm mm -hmm. just going to go on and on and on until they glaze out and go into a dial phone. Right. Uh, <laughs> I'm saying, like, you have to catch their attention before you know they're fully listening. There has to be... There's a point when you're talking where you finally catch as a as an autistic person to what they're talking about. So as someone outside of that, you would you would make sure they're looking at you or not in your eyes, obviously. Don't force them to do that. Well, you make sure they're looking at you, made sure there's like even if they have to fidget, that's fine. But like made sure every once in a while, like you 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 got that. And they're, if they're like, yeah, or something like that. <laughs> Just like, if you're trying to tell them something, make sure you got their attention first before talking. Oh, I, I got that. Well, I understand that as a woman because men do that. <laughs> you know, just, just in general. They could be neurotypical yeah. and, you know, you could be talking to them and they're, they're doing the yes, dear. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, because they can be stuck in their own thoughts and not actually processing what they're talking, what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's not it, that they don't want to listen; it's that they aren't. <laughs> right. Yeah. And um, here's how about movies? I would watch children repeat every line of the movie on their iPads. I'm fine with movies. Uh, wait, 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 what about them? Well, okay. So, um, and I I noticed that I do this is that if I, okay, in my responses, in my interactions with, with normal people, neurodivers, <laughs> you know, neurotypicals, whatever you want to call yeah. it, uh, is that I have a program. I've built up, you know, uh, if somebody says, hey, good morning, I say, hi, good morning, how are you? You know, it's, mm -hmm. it's programmed in my responses, okay? So, if I'm in a situation where something goes outside my program that I don't have, uh, I'm going to need to really think about it, you know, uh, how to respond or, or what they're meaning or something along that line. Um, then that I call that outside my program. I, they basically, oh, okay. they basically get a 404 error in the, <laughs> my brain, you know, and it's so, been, Oh no, go, go on, sorry. Oh no, uh, you go ahead. Uh, it's been a long, long time before I've had any of those problems. But from the fragments of what I remember, um, I used to have that problem. I don't quite remember how I got out of it. I think that's part of the um, everything else that I've worked on just ended up pushing on to that where I'm very analytical about myself. So if I don't have a response, I'll talk about something that happened to me that day or what I'm about to do. 
Uh, th- I mean, that's that's a weird one. Sorry. No, no. I, no. I, I don't really have much for that. No, I understand that. Well, okay. So, like, what uh, what it's ironic was saying about the movies um, is part of my program is that if I've seen a movie and there's there's a quote from it that you know might not directly fit the situation or something along that line, um, I'm going to quote the movie. We're going to need a bigger boat, or that's no that's no moon, that's a space station. <laughs> You oh know. yeah, yeah, yeah. I do that. Yeah, um, and then like, and I think my sons are kind of neurodivergent as well because uh, they have this thing. Like, I used to know every line from the movie Young Frankenstein and the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and some other things that were my special interest. Mm-hmm. Um, they because that's what I do. If I like something, if it's my special interest, I'm going to. I'm going to consume it. I'm going to live it. I'm going to be it, you know? Yeah. Um, I I have, I have something like that too. It's not as in depth as most people, but I'll, if I'm, if I'm thinking about something, if I've like heard something, I'm like, is that real? And I'll look it up. I'll make sure I'll double check. I'll triple check sometimes because I'm just that I'm either that bored or that determined to figure it out. And then once I've learned it, I'm like, okay, I've learned it. Next, mm-hmm. it's, it's not like, it's not like going into a whole new hobby, but I'll, I'll learn new words and stuff like that. Do you find that when someone is giving out incorrect information, that you're almost compelled to correct them? Yeah, that was a big problem. Uh, I that that was that's part of the stool thing where I was like force myself into those situations, try not to respond type of thing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That that was one of the hardest ones to kick out of the chair, so to speak. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, Oh yeah. Like if you can't be an athlete, be an athletic supporter. Yeah. Yes. I love that one. Many great contributions to our society have been made thanks to neurodivergent minds. Yes. Absolutely. I te- Tesla. I absolutely worship Tesla. Um, and it goes even further than that. One of my interests is history. Uh, once you learn about neurodivergency and you go back, you start realizing like, oh, yeah, the, this group of people. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's something (laughs) or uh, a lot of paintings a lot of paintings back then a lot of people had bad eyesight but no glasses so they they drew things that were way out of proportion and stuff like that Mm -hmm. Uh, around the renaissance that started clearing up but that's also around when they started getting medicine and glasses and all that exactly yeah I actually have a a um an artistic history thing that i do it's it's in um no it's not it's in one of my live streams but uh all the way from people thinking neurodiverse people were demon possessed you know to, yeah yeah it's it's exactly it's, what i was talking about uh-huh yeah um like, so, oh boy, Billy sure is a good farmer. He's been doing that for 12 hours straight. <laughs> right, exactly. Or, you know, um, somebody gets maybe gets triggered, has a meltdown in church, and obviously they need to have an exorcism done. <laughs> you know, let's let's do bloodletting on them, you know. And so, the funny thing is that probably worked. It probably did because um, when you're heavily religious or if you lean on certain ideas, it gets into your mind and you, it, even if it isn't real or it, or it is real and the people don't know, either way, it affects you. They probably thought it was helping them and it did get them out of those states. Exactly. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure that if I was in, if I was in a meltdown or a panic state that, you know, if they were draining blood out of me it's definitely gonna you know divert my attention oh i'm not talking about i'm not even talking about blood i'm talking about like getting basically water balls sprayed by holy water and then 
people no. waving across and yelling words. Yes, um, yes. Which which is if, go ahead. No, I don't have anything. Oh no. I was gonna say that's kind of like um the mindfulness or the attention distraction, which is a technique that Yeah. Mm -hmm, that um that needs to be used on autistic people who are in the middle of a meltdown because we're gonna laser focus on these things and sometimes we totally black out or dial tone it. And mm -hmm. in order to to bring them back, that they need that attention distraction. And yeah. Um, so yeah. Uh Elon Musk was asked about his son being autistic and he was so proud of him. One of his best traits was his honesty. Yes. Elon Musk is autistic as well. Um, if my head hurts and someone stomps on my toe, I'm sure I'll take my mind off my head for a minute. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, what do you, yes, no, they're not. ADHD and autism are not the same, but no. yeah. the weird thing about autism is that it comes with a lot of things called comorbidities, which if someone is autistic, they probably have ADHD as well. And um, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or adult mm. uh, attention deficit disorder, those type of things are all the, the same, but it's almost like ordering a happy meal. You know, uh, yeah, yeah. It's not necessarily going to contain all of it all the time, but often that's what it comes with. Exactly. I want to show you guys this thing. Uh, here we go. Let's look. I'm gonna I'm gonna dump us out here. Okay, so autism is a spectrum. So. There's not like if you order something, there's going to be similarities, which is how people get to an autistic diagnosis. Think, uh, to add on to that, think of it like pasta. There are a whole lot of different types of pasta, but they're all made of the same basics. Exactly. I like that penne or fettuccine or... Yeah. Uh, yeah, or just spaghetti. Mm -hmm the rigatonis, the bow ties, all that kind of thing. That's, that's, there's a, a basic diagnostic criteria to be considered autistic and they have the levels one, two, three, um, three is typically the nonverbal that needs a lot of assistance. Right. Uh, yeah. Two is, is a little better, but here's the thing. Even for people that are diagnosed as Asperger's or high functioning autism, um, we can have bits and pieces in our mind, in our personality that are actually uh, maybe more like a level two. Yeah. And if, if we're put into certain situations, we might even dip into a level three in, in certain things. So it's not, it's not just a, you know, just a mold, a cast thing of this person is autistic. Basically yeah. it is a spectrum. It's all of these things in at the same time. And um, so people who say, oh yeah, well, you know, my, my brother's autistic or I knew an autistic person when I was, oh, thank you, Anne-Marie. Um, when when they're looking at people and they think that they understand them, they understand autism. Mm -hmm. And I've heard a lot of people spouting <laughs> off about, oh, well, you know, he's going to think that way because he's autistic. No, if you've yeah. met, one, if you've met yeah. one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. Exactly. That's that's the problem of not having categorized. Everyone thinks everyone's the same, and that's not how it is. Exactly. That's that's why diagnosis is a thing, <laughs> so that you know what's going on. Yes, and then 
once that's it, like uh it's like hysteria for a woman uh before the t before like the 1900s it's like yes. ah they're being loud hysteria <laughs> yes let's put them in an insane asylum <laughs> yeah and so um lobotomize <laughs> uh when he was diagnosed you had to have seven of 14 traits of autism he had nine diagnosed asperger's in 2011 yeah, they diagnose a little differently now. Autistic people are like snowflakes. Yeah. Like. Well, you know, if if you really think about that and you think about it, because I think it's ironic said, uh, what is normal? There is no normal. Because I believe that even neurotypical people, normal people, I hate that, that they call them normal, but neurotypical well people... I, I have this thing with words. It's less that the words are the problem and more the association of them. Normal mm -hmm. is supposed to mean average. Mm -hmm. But they use normal as a baseline instead of average, which is wrong. Exactly. And actually, maybe I can find this. Because I did a little video on it. Oh, -do -do. oh, squirrel! Sorry. <laughs> I yeah, I found some. I found something else. Um. Mm. Hang on. Hang on. Hang on. Stop. I find this other thing. Do, 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 do. One moment, please. Thank you for your patience. No, that's not it. That's not it. That's not it. This is it. I think. Yeah, I'm going to show this. Which is silly, mm -hmm. but I'm going to show it anyway. It's called Inside My Autistic Brain. Let me know if you guys can hear this, okay? Hi, it's Grandma Sherry. Welcome back. I'm so happy to see you. Can you hear if that? If you're here for the first time, please subscribe, like the video, and set the bell to all for notifications. Hey, so I'm here. Yes. Can you hear it? Yep. Okay. All right, cool. So we'll just we'll just run this then. Because I am hashtag actually autistic. <laughs> and I wasn't diagnosed as autistic until I was in my forties. My forties. So that means that I had forty some odd years of just being weird and trying to get along in society and overthinking everything. So we're gonna kind of talk about that today. We're gonna talk about the autistic thought process and some stuff and what autism is according to the DSM-5 thought process. We'll be right back. It's almost like everybody knows somebody on the spectrum. When they first diagnosed me, I thought they were totally wrong. Because obviously, to me, that was a little boy's problem. This isn't too long, but it kind of sums up what, what Claw and I have been talking about. So bear with me, okay? That didn't happen to grown women. Grown women in the 40s. But I was diagnosed as level one, which is high functioning autism. And with that, we can get along quite well in society. People don't really guess that we're autistic. I get all the time, but you don't look autistic. What does autistic look like? You, me. So 
give us a second here to figure out what do you know about autism? There are three levels of autism spectrum disorder, ASD, which are described in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders with Condition, or the DSM-5. A person with ASD is further diagnosed with either ASD level one, level two, or level three, depending on how severe their disorder is and how much support they need in their daily life. <laughs> it's important to understand that autism is a spectrum. There's not just level one, level two, and level three, but there's all kinds of gradients between them. Someone could be diagnosed with level one, but have severe symptoms that are closer to a level two, or someone could be diagnosed as level three, but their symptoms are mild and closer to level two. So most of my life, I've just kind of stumbled around being weird because I had no idea I was autistic. And I really felt like I was on the wrong planet because I had no idea how to interact or talk with these humans because obviously they're not like me. With that, I developed what I call my program. It's like an operating system in my brain. And through therapy and seminars and reading books and things like that, I learned how to respond. I learned how to control my stimming or my, just my body language in order to get along in society. Now the program has worked really well for me and I actually kind of developed a sense of humor with it and more funny and make people happy. But the thing is that if something is outside my program, if I don't have a response for it, you know, search the hard drive, no coding there, there's a couple things that happen. I will do one of few things. One might be that I just take a really long time to respond and, you know, I just have this blank stare. The other thing is I go mute, situational mutism. And I literally can't speak. I have no words. Everybody's kind of been flabbergasted at one time or another. And so you might understand that just in the point of I'm speechless or I have no words. Meltdown. And when I melt down, I have to leave. I have to leave the party right now. And I have to go home. I have to be quiet. I have to sleep. And I have to recover. That's because I don't think the same as everybody else. So in the next video, we're going to take a tour through the brain, the neurotypical brain, and the neurodiverse autistic brain. So that actually didn't have the normal thing on it. So I'm sorry. It was boring. But um, squirrel. What? Oh, no, we were talking about normal. We were talking about normal. Yeah, nothing is normal. Normal is a statistic. Normal is a, you know, middle-aged white guy, you know, with 2.5 children. So, are you still with me? Yeah, there you are. Well, yeah, sorry, I, I had to step away for a moment. I, I put my mic up again. <laughs> oh, me too. No, no, no. no, no. That was um, actually when I started the thing, I stepped away too because I had to get another drink and I had to pee. <laughs> exactly, but um, no, nobody is yeah. truly normal. Yeah, uh, that, that's the big problem with like words like that. They end up like they end up being forced into places where they're not. Normal is average, but a lot of people don't know that, so it's starting to not be that definition anymore. Yes, I love that. I love that because there are more people being diagnosed with neurodiversity than ever before. And why is that? It's not that they weren't there before. Right. I think it's the recognition. I think it's the awareness. Mm -hmm. that more people are, are coming about. Um, so I'm probably going to, I'm probably going to wrap this up. We've been on here a while. Thank you. We but have. 
Go ahead. Oh, we have. That's all. I, that's all I meant. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah, and evidently your mom wants to wake up Pewter so he can bark, <laughs> <laughs> or she can bark. I don't know. Hey. Uh, but anyway, so what do you wish people knew about you and your diagnosis? Me specifically, not in general. You specifically, and then we'll go general. We'll do we'll do micro and then we'll do macro. How's that sound? Me specifically, they don't need to know anything. Um I can fully handle myself. Unless we're very close or at least on the edge of being friends, they don't need to know I'm autistic. I can handle myself. Okay. Good job. And so in general, as far as autism awareness, what do you wish people knew? Do you, okay. Do you think most people understand autism? No. Or, okay. So do you think that they're just surf surface level? They, they either surface level stereotype or they have one section of autism they know and they think that's, I mean, I guess that's the same thing, isn't it? There's like level one and level two. There's surface level stereotyping by accident, and then there's the denial one, where like they they don't they think that you're messing with them, saying that they're that autism is separate and sections, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have um, I have this saying that everybody knows, and um, when it comes to people's intentions, you know, like. You were talking about um, sarcasm and, and how, you know, we're very literal about s some certain things and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And as I've aged, because I'm like a thousand years older than you are, <laughs> but um, if I, as I've aged, I people tend to... Um, say well they said this and so obviously they intended to hurt me and i say that you can't assume someone's intentions because oftentimes they don't even understand them themselves yeah and so i find that with my autism people will will say things like oh well this is what Grandma Sherry is doing, or you know, this is what's happening, or whatever. And, and I'm like, "Yo, you're not in my mind." <laughs> my intention is, you know, because if I'm if I'm in a situation where I'm kind of outside my program, I am sometimes not even aware of what I'm doing because a lot of us are like a survival mode. You seem to be very. And I'd really like to have your mom and you walk up together so we could talk about parenting because she's done an awesome job with you, your your mom and your dad. I, I don't know. Mm. Um, would you be up for that? I would totally be up for that. Yeah, because I know we talked a little bit about what par how parents should behave with their autistic child. We touched on it, yeah. Yeah, we touched on that. And I'd really like to, to do kind of a deep dive into that. Sound good? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. okay, we'll arrange that. But in the meantime, Claude, thank you so much for coming up and, and talking. And, and 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 thank you for having me. Yes, it's, oh, sure, let me know when. Okay, mom's down for it. That would be awesome. Yes, Okay. So um, I'm going to drop you down. Do you want to say anything or do you have any parting thoughts for everybody? Well, no, I'm honestly not really. Um, besides stay safe and uh, keep learning what you can. Okay. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Um, yes. Yes. Everybody just enjoyed this so much. They think you're brilliant. <laughs> You're very smart. You're very articulate. And somebody had a uh, 
a suggestion that you should go into schools and talk to them and teach them. Oh, like, um, like, a, like a counselor? Um, maybe like a, like a consultant. Yeah, okay. I, I can kind of see that. Yeah. I could look into that, but um, <laughs> I don't even know where I'd start there. Yeah. Um, I thought that was that was kind of an interesting, an interesting suggestion. But I do have a thing because, uh, my channel, the Burrow. I try to make it a a safe, warm space mm -hmm. for people who are different, you know, so that we can share with each other and and help each other through life struggles because there's mm -hmm. so many things you know that we don't oh look at this thank you for speaking to us claw mucho love keep learning <laughs> is wisdom my dude <laughs> oh thank you twist yes teach the teachers i like that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes but anyway so at the end at the end of of my live streams I have a bunch of different helplines for people to call because oftentimes we feel like we're alone you know and maybe we can't we can't handle it and a lot of people don't have connections with other people that help mm -hmm. them through claw rocks and he likes dragons my kind of guy rock on claw <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I do have these helplines available. So, you know, if you're going through something that you think um, you just need someone to talk to or you're feeling kind of alone, there's a lot, a lot of helplines out there. You don't have to be on the edge of something. You know, if you're just struggling, reach out to these people. They have free resources available locally. You know, they can refer you to different programs and things like that. So um, always at the end of my live streams, every video that I have, it's in the description and it's in my about section. And please remember that Grandma Cher loves you so much and we're not alone. Thank you, Claw. I'm going to do my outro.